perfect time to bring in uh, a publisher of the Bulwark, host of the Focus Group podcast and executive director of the Republican Accountability Project, Sarah Longwell. Her latest piece for The New York Times is entitled, What 17 of Trump's Best People Said About Him. Um, Sarah, I would say that these Republicans, these House Republicans that we were just talking about are many Trumps, but they're doing massive damage to the process, to, to the Republican Party, to the ability to get anything done, even things they want. But tell us about your piece. Who did you hear from? Well, actually, what we did is we went back and compiled all of the members of Trump's cabinet who had spoken out against him. And this is unprecedented to have so many senior officials come out and say things like, this man is a danger to democracy. He is responsible for the attack on the Capitol. And I think that you guys would agree with me when I say one of the big afflictions of the Republican Party over the last many years has been a problem of silence, an unwillingness to speak up, an unwillingness to vote for impeachment after January 6th. People have allowed Donald Trump to essentially get a, Republicans, especially by, by not speaking up against Donald Trump, they've allowed him to get away with things that are unspeakable attacks on our democracy. And I wanted to really use this as an opportunity both to demonstrate how unprecedented it was, but also to use it as a call to action. As we go into this general election, Donald Trump is going to be the Republican nominee. Regardless of what happens in New Hampshire, he's going to be the Republican nominee. And a lot of these folks who've spoken out and even written books or done profiles in the Atlantic, they did it a long time ago, after January 6th. And I think there needs to be a concerted and sustained effort of a lot of these people to speak out going forward and tell the American people just how dangerous Donald Trump is. They worked up close with him. They saw the things that alarmed them that that they've been that they've talked about um, just a little bit. But they're going to have to tell. They, I think there's this idea from them that they can't make a difference to voters that if they speak out, you know, Donald Trump get, just gets stronger. That's true of the base of the Republican Party. It is not true of swing voters. And one of the things that um, I think sometimes people don't understand. I've seen Mark Kelly quoted saying things like, well, I spoke out, I said something, and, you know, it's a half a day's news story. And I think that that, again, true with the base, not true with these swing mm -hmm. voters and not true as we go into the election. People haven't been paying attention to the election. Average voters, they don't read The Atlantic. No offense to The Atlantic, love The Atlantic. But, you know, your average sort of medium information voter, that's not what they're reading. And so you've got to go out in a sustained way and say things. And I think a lot of the, the folks that we haven't heard as much from are the people who are the generals. You know, your Jim Mattises. They will make a difference to people if they say something. And so my hope is that they hear this call. These are people who have defended democracy overseas. Um, they have, have uh -huh. uh, you know, sent soldiers into battle. And so my ask is that they defend democracy once again by telling people what they saw and the danger that Donald Trump poses. I think that would be a real service to the country. So, Sarah, so many who have served in uniform resist talking politics, but this seems like it could be indeed the exception. And, and to your point, there was a lot of weight, a lot of importance from the words of those who testified before the January 6th committee who were Republicans, who were there up close, who saw Trump's behavior that day. And that seemed to break through. I assume that's the theory here as well, that those who were next to Trump, not just on January 6th, but throughout his term and could speak credibly as to what he would do next, that's who you're going to want to hear from you know, if not perhaps daily between now and November. That is absolutely right. I think the people who served with Trump, when people told their stories, when Cassidy Hutchinson uh, and other brave people who worked for Donald Trump came out and made the case that he was unfit and also said what they saw, that he didn't do anything about January 6th, um, that had an enormous impact. And I do think that for somebody like, you know, Jim Mattis or some of the other generals, I think they may tell themselves, look, it's not my job as somebody who is in the military to get involved in politics. And I understand that. But I think when you take a senior role in an administration uh, with a, a Republican president, um, that 
you've engaged in politics. Um, and I look, and I give them all the credit. I think that they joined the administration because they wanted to be the adults in the room. They knew Donald Trump was dangerous back then, or at least unfit, and they wanted to be there to serve the country. I think they did it all for the right reasons. But I think that they have to serve the country again by saying what they saw. We know because they give blind quotes, you know, to backgrounds uh, on people who are writing for people who are writing books. And uh, they've said things once or twice. We know that they think he's dangerous. And there's people like Mark Esper who have been out there saying that Donald Trump's a threat to democracy. And so I think one of the things also that's the theory here is you need to speak with one voice. There is safety in numbers. There's amplification in numbers. You can't just have one person here or there because they get excommunicated from the party or called a rhino or they do to them what they did to Liz Cheney. <laughs> you need to all come together and say it loudly, relentlessly, and in a concerted way so that swing voters hear it. Because there's already, um, I think as you can see, yes, Donald Trump owns the base of the Republican Party and the base is quite large, large enough to win any primary. But there have been people that he has been alienating, Republicans that Trump has been alienating for years. Uh, and that is who, but they are still Republicans. And that's who these uh, people need to speak to, to help them understand that it's time uh, to abandon the Trump version of the Republican Party. You can read Sarah's full piece at the New York Times .com. Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark. Sarah, thanks so much. As always, we appreciate it.